Good morning. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to 2023 Spring Seminar. I'm going to give you a quick little introduction, a welcome to an update, what's going on at the waterfront. Then I'm going to have Travis come up and he's going to give you some more details about Raver, some interesting projects going on and some of the crew over there. We're then going to have Tony speak, give you some updates on his adventures, some of the stuff he's been up to is pretty interesting. Um, we're also going to have Maura stand up representing NSA, and then we are going to wrap the morning up with Mark Faraday um, from Mass Audubon. Um, and so around 1040, he's supposed to be speaking. Um, so, so I don't know if you guys had a chance to go down the waterfront. You probably noticed that the bulkhead has seen some updates. Um, it was quite a busy winter for all of us. Uh, we basically have completed phase one of the project. You'll see what used to be kind of some concrete. Um, it, the bulkhead's been expanded. We have stone laid down. It's also meant that we've been able to rework the waterfront as far as the docks, uh, the hoisting area. Um, so it's been pretty exciting. Again, phase one, we still have a couple more phases down the line. It'll be a few years before we probably move forward with the next. Um, but again, it's it's exciting to see that work finally come. It's been a few years in the process, just getting permitting. So that's been been good. And it's, it's the crew down there working around it has been, everyone's been on the same page, which has been great. Um, another little um, factor, um, the dumpsters, again, it's a subtle thing, but um, recycling. We've rebuilt the dumpster unit and the recycling is now hidden behind. Um, I mentioned that because it's, it's to try to lessen random people coming through and dumping stuff um, in the recycling bins that aren't meant to be there. Uh, but we want to make sure you guys are able to utilize it because it is important. So it's pretty obvious once you find it, but it is kind of hidden out of the way, um, but will make sense. Um, we also, that's really the biggest thing, yeah, really there. So, um, and then if you do have something, if you need the dumpster, there's a lock on it. Um, if you just talk with us, we'll try to unlock it during the day. But again, that's trying to lessen some of the trash and overflow that we get in the summer for people driving by. So, yeah, excuse me one second. Yeah. yeah. Hey, hey guys, how you doing? Back also, yeah. Also down there. Um, so Catherine is um, she's unable to make it this morning. Um, she's directing sailing school again. The sailing school program is now up and running. Um, you can book online um, through um, our online portal. Um, and again, start getting lessons planned out or group lessons, whatever it may be. Also, Catherine is now going to be moving into the office um, in a certain capacity slowly and helping, kind of taking on steps within the service um, and taking on more of a managerial role over the course of the summer. So you may see that she's reaching out to you about other things other than sailing school and maybe service stuff, um, general boatyard information. So that's going to be someone that you're going to start to interact with. Um, if you haven't had a chance, um, she's fantastic. You're going to, you're all going to love her. Um, and again, so you'll be seeing her a lot more this summer um, on the office side. The, um, and then the final thing, just want to talk about the crew in general. We have Matt and Trevor and Terry down at the waterfront, um, Haley in the office, um, and, um, and myself. It's been an awesome crew. I mean, these guys are great. It's been a tough winter. Um, we've had a ton of work. Um, like most places around here, we're stretched pretty thin, unfortunately. Um, but the people that are here have been awesome. Um, and I'd like to bring Travis up to talk both about Raver, but also some of the people we have over there who have been really doing an awesome job. So. Travis, thank you. I am Travis. Um, if I haven't met you guys, I'm sure I'll meet you guys sometime. I run the Raber service yard as well as a lot of the away deliveries. Um, and so over at, at Raber, we've put in a concrete pad, which if you guys drive through, you'll see. We're installing a new um, new power washing system uh, to replace one we have in Chatham. And this is going to take the water that we use in the fall to power wash your guys' boats uh, and recycle it, clean it. Uh, run it through filters so that we using a more closed system, a more environmentally friendly system that just power washing and letting it run away. We have one in Chatham. It's a it's an aging system. It's a smaller pad. So we're updating that. So that was a big project we did over the winter there. 
Um, and then so we have Colin, who's our who he's out in the yard. He's doing the bottom painting, the cleaning of boats, mm -hmm. getting them ready to go in this year. Uh, and then we have Carl, who a lot of you, if you get maintenance varnish work done, big projects done, you'll see. Oh, second. Like, if you guys get big varnish work paint jobs stuff like that you'll see that's a lot of carl's work um captain was in there this this winter as well a little bit but for the most part it's carl doing all the the high-end varnish and stuff like that so those are the, the the crew right now as you can tell it's it's small but we're uh we're crushing as well as we can. So thank you very much. Thank you, okay, um, it's my turn. Uh, thank you guys all for coming in and also thank you all who voted for the classic vote. Um, it was a huge honor um, to get the second place. In a lot of ways, it was uh, better for us Quick story, um, uh, Haley, sorry, Leslie and uh, and I um, flew over and Dan, one of the boat builders from our shop had gone flown home to Cornwall the day before. And uh, as it turned out, we arrived in uh, London and Dan could make it to the, to the, to the award ceremony and uh, and so they did the whole thing. I already known that we were uh, we weren't winners, and that was all cool. And um, but the winner had Dan had worked for, <laughs> and when he got out of boat building school, which the the fellow that owned the shop went to the same boat building school in in Cornwall, um, decided he was a young guy and he decided to start his own business. And uh, so it just couldn't have been better. So you have a young, one of our guys who had worked for this fellow before he came to the States to work for us. And he's starting his own business and he, and he won the award for best new design. And um, it was just great to be there and interact with all of them. And I, I don't know if Leslie's fully recovered, but I ran around two days. Uh, we touched everything you can touch from Greenwich to uh, uh, from the Cuddy Sark to the London Bridge, you name it. We we tapped everything with a couple of Guinnesses and uh, had a great time. Um, so uh, if anybody needs, there's coffee here. If anybody needs a restroom, there is one in the back through this back door here. Um, and that area back there is, is my office and where Anita works, who Anita is kind of the uh, behind the scenes person, but probably many of you spoken to her on phone. She she does all her billing and she's a dedicated employee and, um, and she does a great job for us. So Julian's kind of giving you the over the uh, where's my uh, I could I don't want it to be too much of an infomercial here because uh, because there's so much to talk about. Um, so. Let's, uh, before I get into some more stories of what's been going on, um, let's just do what we always do every year before we get it really into the seminar. And let's just talk uh, boating safety. Um, as you can see, like the spring flowers, the cat boats are popping up on the pond and uh, one of them might be yours. Uh, and um, it's exciting. It, it, we're, all, we're all coming out of our winter routines and and getting you know into the spring thing, and and we're all really excited uh, what the summer has to offer. Um, but we got to be safe, okay? So we have to you know get down to our boat. If it's your if you're a full service customer, you know so double check doesn't mean we've checked everything, you know. So you get aboard before you head out. You want to check for you've got life jackets that fit whoever's on board, okay? Um, and then uh, you, you then go through your the size of the boat you have, the safety equipment. So if you have an engine, you want a uh, fire extinguisher, uh, you need a hailing device, a whistle or a horn. Um, if you're an outboard, well, 
if you're a smaller boat, say 18 feet and under, you need a paddle. So, you know, and, uh, and a boat hook is nice, it's not required, but when you're coming up to, to your mooring, you know, having a boat hook is nice. Um, cell phones, VHF, we've talked about that in the past. It's kind of now an either or. Uh, we monitor channel 12 here for our launch service. And if you can reach us uh, out in the bay, which is hard, especially at low tide, because with a four foot drop in tide and all, and all the hills around us, we, our antenna it really isn't high enough to pick you up if you're in Big Pleasant Bay. Sometimes we can if it's high tide. So, you know, pull up the cell phone and, and give us a call. But remember, Sundays, we're not always here. Okay, so if it's a Sunday and you're in a jam out there, um, it's going to be Riders Cove or uh, Nauset Marine or Coast Guard if it's really serious. Um, so, and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, help me out. Uh, VHF, we have to talk that. Uh, flares. Flares, yep. Flares. So, flares are good. You know, if you obviously if you're going out in the evening, so if you are running lights, but during the day, um, you know, it's going to be that horn or this. Okay. Yeah. You know, that means, you know, you know, that's why we all wave to each other once we sail by, because it means everything's good. But if you're doing this, <laughs> things aren't so good. So maybe come over and uh, and check it out and see, see what they need. Um, I know I'm forgetting something. Anchor. 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 Yeah. 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 All right. This is like a test. All right. <laughs> Quiz. Yeah. Anchor. So um, important to have the right size anchor um, for your boat. So generally, you know, 16 pounds and under for boats out here in, in the Aries for the, for the smaller boats. Um, and I think about 50 feet of line, and I really like a little bit of chain between the anchor and the line to help hold that, the fluke down so you can get a good grab. Um, so, yeah, what else? Come on. Centerboard line. Centerboard line, yeah. So we get aboard and um, we really, good one, Larry. Um, and this is something we can miss, okay? Because we're, we're, we're going around, we're checking out the boats, you know, before the customers, before you guys get aboard. But we can miss that. So you want to check as a, the, any fraying on your centerboard line, okay? Um, especially on the Marshall 18s, okay? Because they glass their centerboard pin in and it is a bear, you know, to um, sometimes to, uh, if, if the board gets jammed or stuck or the pin is it, to get it out. But generally we can lift it all the way up with the fork truck at Raver and get to the pennant. Um, on, on the marshals. Uh, but that, that's, that's a great one. Um, anything else? What am I forgetting? Go th going through the safety check. Sorry? Float. Float plan, sure. Absolutely. So um, if we're, especially if we're single handed, we're going out on our own and, uh, and we're new to Pleasant Bay, we want to tell someone at home, what, what the basic plan is for the day. So if something were to happen and you're overdue, you can come down here, we'll go out in the work boat and go in the general direction that you told that person where you'd be. So float plans are, are really important. And if it's a work day and you know if you're planning to come in by four and Julian and the crew are all down at the waterfront and again, you're going out single handing, just let them know, you know, that I should be in four. I forever, every, you know, I'm so lucky to live here. Um, I, every evening I go down and I count all the boats. You know, I check, I, it was just instinctive. You know, I just go around and I look at every, sometimes I see a boat sinking, but. <laughs> and, and run out and, with a pump, but um, no, I, I, I'd, uh, yeah, just check, make sure everybody's in. And uh, and I've told the story a million times, but I won't, but there's a couple of really funny stories, but it's not in and where the people were. Um, so, so anything else? Yeah. Actually, uh, 
based on an experience I had last summer where I did fall out of old goes boat. And think about how you're going to be able to get back into the boat. Uh, and, you know, some boats don't have a ladder. Right. Ahead. Yeah. Right. And get a little older, it's more difficult to pull yourself in. Yeah. Great one, Alan. Yeah. So, yeah, that's um, really, really, really important for the, especially if you're single handing and you and you think, oh, I've done this a million times. I've made this move. Whether it is to go up. And, and adjust the peak halyard or whatever it might be, or go up, um, you know, maybe go to toss the anchor or something, and uh, and boom, you find yourself in the water. So on the cat boats, uh, you can do, you can have a rudder step and a transom step and climb aboard. Uh, Jeff, um, we should speak about, I'll take a second on, so this is Jeff's canvas shop. There's a little less room every year in here for everyone because his shop is doing so well and uh, he gets more tables and more equipment. And he also is a, is a welder. And uh, so he's designed these, these ladders here and uh, they're all quick release and so they store easily down below. And the only thing on deck are these uh, two brackets here. So, oh, that's uh, yeah. And so it's still a little bit of time if it's an emergency um, to get it all set up, but at least you have a way to get get aboard if you have someone else. But if you single hand a lot, um, to Alan's point, you need to you need to have thought a way through with whether it's a hanging a line over the side or a rope ladder or something um, to get yourself back on board. All right. What do you say? Oh, registration. Okay, so you want to go down and double check that your registration numbers are up to date and your sticker. Okay, and um, if you have any you know questions on that, Anita is excellent with that sort of thing. Um, yeah, we'll move on. Good safety. Okay. And your bird. Um, well, wind direction. Yeah, so wind direction. Larry's bringing point up. It's not so much a, it, in a sense it's safety in the sense that you know it's nice to have something at the top of the mast to help you know where the wind is <laughs> um, on the cat boats we're big fans of the of the bergy for two reasons one it keeps the birds off here in the pond <laughs> and number two um since it's a cat boat you really don't need that fussy fussy davis wind indicator um because you're just <laughs> trying to get a general idea and then you you get all your uh, you set your sail based on uh, the uh, you set your sheet line you know, based on the wind direction until you still you're feeling the boat going at its at both speed on the direction you want to go, whether it's to windward or broad reach. All right. Um, yeah, checking tide and weather is important as well. Uh, thanks, Julian. So the weather station is down. I don't know if anybody here knows more about it, but when you go to the normally channel three, um, you're not getting, it's all blank on the VHF. I still haven't figured out how to get that standard weather yet. I, I need to take the time and, and make a couple of calls so we can inform you. But when you get on your boat, if you use that VHF for weather and you go to three or one or three, it's, you're gonna, it's blank, it's down for some reason. All right, so use your phone, weather channel, whatever one you have, wind app, that sort of thing. Reef, you know, set your reef here in the pond before you head out. It's always easier. Set the reef here and then get out and find it's not quite as windy as they said it would be, and then release the reef out there versus getting out there thinking, oh, I can handle 15 to 20 and realizing, <laughs> ah, I, nah, I can't handle 15. <laughs> so, um, all right. All right. So let me get, uh, Boy, there's so much. Um, am I good? Um, yeah. yeah, you're good. Okay. All right. So, where do I start? I'm going to start at boat building shop. So we've so Leslie, we've already spoken of, um, has uh, taken on. We've taken on quite a bit, um, and it includes a, a restoration or remodel 
of an 1893 cat boat. And before I forget, I just want to say that I'll be leaving here and going to Raver, and I'll, and the doors will be open. So anybody wants to visit the shop, I will be there and I can give you a, a, a tour of what we're up to. So this is, you know, I, this is, you can't see it, but yeah, yeah. this is an 1893 cat boat. Sorry. Hold it up to the camera. Do what? Yeah. The camera. Hi, camera. <laughs> 1893 Capo. I can't pronounce the designer, designer's name. Uh, he's not a, uh, it's not a Crosby, it's not Fenwick Williams, uh, uh, but he was, a, he was a New Englander and he designed and, and built this boat. She's really, really special. Um, and so we had the job this winter to, um, for the Peterson, uh, Kurt Peterson, who runs Cat, Cat Boat Charters, out of um, Edgar Town, you see the the cat boat with the American flag. So he's expanding his business, and now you're going to see this boat with the American flag in Newport uh, Harbor, Rhode Island, in a few weeks. And uh, and we are just pushing for the finish line on this project. We moved the bulkhead forward four feet, repowered it, um, and then. It's got elaborate, elaborate, um, fine uh, woodworking in mahogany, well, varnish seats and staving, and um, she's a plank on frame, obviously plank, plank on frame boat, and and so we could, we had to continue that fine joinery into into the new four feet of, of uh, seating space, and then put in hot water, outdoor shower. Uh, new galley, new head, holding tanks, um, and so uh, she. Oh yeah, so she's twenty nine foot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, eleven foot beam, and uh, she's one of the old Nantucket style cat boats. So what I mean by that is, um, she's the underslung rudder. So she's got a reverse transom, and you don't see the barn door rudder. Really, really sweet, and. Um, and they were very popular in the 1800s, late 1800s, early 1900s in Nantucket. You wouldn't see them that often uh, on the mainland side. Some, I honestly don't know the answer uh, why they why they were so popular, in particular in, with the, the whaling fleet and in, uh, working the waters uh, of uh, Nantucket. Uh, they were work boats, obviously, back then, but they preferred the underslung rudder. Uh, versus the barn door, so that that project is uh, is coming coming to uh, a close. And our other exciting project is um, our XFC twenty two, which I opened with the the award ceremony in London. And um, uh, we are um, going to debut debut this boat in its full glory um, next week down in South Carolina. So she's uh, getting loaded up Monday and getting shipped down to uh, Beaufort, South Carolina, where I'll meet her and rig her. And then we have a, a week of, uh, of racing. And I can't tell you how nervous I am. <laughs> because the owner, uh, he, he um, you may know him, his name is Paul, and he has a rock crushing business. And, um, he just bought another crusher and he just got the job to take down a uh, for a new the new solar uh, all the work going on with the solar and wind in New Bedford and to take down an old factory and crush all the rocks but it all has to be done by next week and so he says Tony I'm not going to be there and so now I have to run this thing and uh, I, I'm on pins and needles and, but super excited uh, it's going to be it's going to be really interesting. Uh, this is the XFC um, 22. I want to give you just a little history because some of you are going to uh, kind of say what, but there is a there is some uh, meaning to the madness. So this is the boat here, and she has a traditional, some semi traditional cat rig, and she also has a Code Zero Jenniker and a staysail. 
And um, what we're doing here is uh, what Paul wanted to do is we started with the 14 and um, he was very pleased with based on our design, how well it went through the water. And we're, we're basically going back in time. So back in the 18, late 1800s, there was capo racing off of Hull, Massachusetts. Every weekend, people would be standing on the beach, betting on the capo that would win. And, um, and I'm speaking, for, you know, this, this is all from Stan Grayson, who was a capo aficionado. Uh, you can read his articles in Wooden Boat, who's really studied the history of capo racing. So back then, the, the only rule was the boat had to be the, the beam to length ratio and the mast had to be approximately 18 inches after the stem head. And then beyond that, whatever it takes to win the race. And so if you look back on the pictures of those boats, there's just in, you know, there are code zero genitors for what they would, they, what their interpretation of back then would be wing and wing with poles and the boats are just, you know, just <laughs> and you know 10 15 people back on the stern holding the bow up and 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 it was it was fun till bicycle <laughs> till uh what was it golf or canoeing or something came along and, uh, and, uh, and people found other things to do uh but it, it went on for a number of years and and then the, there's the famous story that uh, Harishoff uh, and his brother built a cat boat. There's a, their first boat, so they were teenagers. They designed it, built, and um, she was fully battened, gaff headed, and she went out and beat everything. And and it's it's in the in the history books. The cat boat was his favorite boat because he did so well with it at an early age, and it generated. So much, you know, history from there. Um, that boat is on display in the Harishoff Museum. It's the first one you see as you come in. Um, and and so what we're doing here is essentially going back in time, but using today's technology. Okay, between design and sails and sail area and and uh, full battens and all those sort of things. So when somebody says. Uh, you're whatever, like, what the heck is Tony doing? Just that's why I tell the story because I want you to know I'm not off my rock. <laughs> there, there is a, there is a reason for this. We're 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 pushing the envelope. We're going back in time, but also showing you know what we can do in this modern time with cat boats. I'm still a traditionalist at heart, um, and after next week, I may. <laughs> Definitely be a traditional. <laughs> Where did you get the idea for the top of the sail? So that was um, so that was working with the sail maker, but um, we so we want to keep on the cat boat. We want to keep the center of effort as low as possible. Okay, so if we wanted to do a traditional Marconi rig, it would mean making the mast even taller and um, moving the center of effort up and create more healing. So. This is, you'll see this on a, a lot of modern boats. It's, and again, it just goes back um, in time where when you see these modern Amoka uh, 60s and uh, racing around the world right now with these uh, uh, fully, with the, the head on the uh, top of their mainsail cut off with a batten, mm -hmm. that's essentially a gaff. That's mm -hmm. using, mm -hmm. you know, that the technology will lower the center effort. No. And use it, and, and so that this we're calling this batten or gaff. Um, okay, <laughs> but but that's the reason. Yeah, yeah. What's the weight of the boat? She's twenty two feet, but she's thirty seven. Uh, she's got a thirteen foot bowsprit. Yeah, thirty five. Yeah, yeah. She has two bowsprits, um, and anyway. Um, all right, uh, so. Um, so that's what's been going on in the shop. We're also building a 16 foot Lynx cabin. It's going to be in uh, Mattapoisett. Matta yep, Mattapoisett. Then we have a 14 foot cat going to Chatham Yacht Club, another 14 cat going to Canada. 
And then the exciting news, which I'll end on boat building, is uh, the Caracal 19, which many of you may know. Um, Dustin and Leslie and the crew have built a uh, mold. We have a fire, uh, we built a, hull, a wooden hull, which will, when the boat's finished is going to, uh, I think Barnegat Bay, I'm sorry, I can't I remember, but I think it's Barnegat Bay. And, but the owner was willing to let us uh, use the hull so we can lay up a mold. So the Caracals going forward, we already have our first order, um, will be fiberglass. So this will drop the cost by about 20% and allow us to um, build them a little faster. They'll still be traditional from the shear up. They'll have traditional shear clamp, deck beams, deck, uh, with a dynel and non skid finish, so have very with all the cockpit will look like very much like a wooden boat, but the hull itself um, will be fiberglass with a uh, glassed in centerboard trunk. So we're hoping that um, to grow the business, the boat building business behind the you know, the fourteen, um, the various models of that, the sixteen open and cabin, and now adding the caracal. So. Um, it's a, it's a pretty exciting. Um, that first hull should be in Leslie's shop sometime um, in July, early or late June. We hope so. You can check that out. And we are also um, going to be experimenting with a mold that we got from California. Uh, we're doing a custom powerboat, um, and there is a uh, negotiation that we're having right now with. Uh, being able to produce these boats, these power boats, They're, it's a it's a vintage uh, Chris Craft design, uh, very popular in the '60s. Has a really nice look to it, and um, great for Pleasant Bay. So we're uh, going to build the first one, see how it goes, and we may continue offering those as well. All right, let's get to um, Pleasant Bay. So the changes in the bay. Um, I was on the phone yet uh, Thursday uh, with Ted Keen. Uh, Ted is the uh, postal management for Town Chatham, and um, his phone is ringing all the time uh, over various issues going on in Chatham with the Fish Pier. And well, he's, he's, I don't know how he does it, but in any case, he took time out to uh, talk to me about what's going on in Pleasant Bay, and. I was concerned, uh, we started a conversation where I was concerned that a lot had changed over the winter based on our catboat, Carolyn, who always leaves here early and his trip to uh, Milk, uh, to um, Oyster River in Chatham. And he reported, he ran aground uh, as he made his approach to the Stage Harbor opening in, and going in where he normally at that time of tide, he wouldn't run aground. But the, none of the buoys were up, and I've now pretty much figured out he just got a little off track because he couldn't. There were no buoys. None of the, where the harbor master moves the orange markers around, they weren't out. So he had no no sense of really where he was um, because Ted said things are are actually pretty good. Um, there are not, uh, there is not a lot of changes um, to report uh, from last year, except for one, which I'll get to. Um, so not many of you ventured out to the ocean or to Stage Harbor, but for those of you who do or are thinking about it, um, you know, by June uh, or sooner that all the markers will be out and um, just pay attention to them very carefully. Um, you really want to, if you're doing it for the first time, you, you definitely need two people because there's a bunch of S terms. So you, you'll see a buoy and you'll think, because there's another one in front of you and you'll think, oh, I just go to that one. Well, in fact, there's another way over here that you got to go to before you go to that one. Because if you go to that one, you're going to ground. Um, so you need that, you, you need that watchful eye as you make those turns. And these are, these are buoys that get moved, you know, based on the, on the shoulder, so it's not exactly where they were last year either. If you marked them on your GPS, it's it's not going to be the same. 
So uh, the sands are shifting, but the, the depths are still okay. Do you recommend going through during slack tide or? Yeah, it's just, I was gonna get to that. Yeah, so Jeff, yeah, the, um, um, yeah, so Ted did say that it, it low tide, um, there is a little less, there is a little bit of, there is more sand. So um, you don't want to do any of this at, at low. You want to do it two hours either side of high and then try to catch the current right at slack, which is that rip along Morris Island. Okay, um, you, you want to try and time that and, uh, and the current goes east, west, west, east, and there's, it doesn't, it actually doesn't make any sense <laughs> the way the tide goes based on the moon. Uh, but in fact, because of Mont Moy and the way it is, it, it's the way it is. So um, you, you, you want to try to hit it at slack. But if you've got a good, strong engine, um, you, you can do it. And you, you're not going to sail against that current. Or, yeah, you're not going to sail against that current. You've got to have, you got a motor sail um, if you're going to try it against the current. So the big change though, or not big, but the one thing he wanted me to note to uh, our Pleasant Bay sailors is, uh, or two things, is at the Narrows, the bar appears to have, it's, uh, it's stretching out closer to, from, from the island to the mainland, okay? So be wary, uh, the boot, I, we did, I sailed last week, I went from Little Bay through the Narrows and around Pleasant Bay back. And it was and it was three hours after high, two hours after high and the bar, you could see it. And it definitely is, it's uh, it's reaching out toward the mainland, toward the East Egg a little bit. Um, so for those of us who love to cut that bar off, <laughs> uh, um, just, just be wary that it's, there's a little less water than you're used to right there. But the channel is still, there's, still plenty of safety room for people uh, to get through. And remember, for those of you who've been to the seminar in the past, we're not supposed to sail through the narrows, okay? Port to port, port to port, port to port. If you can't do it, you gotta lower your sail, turn your motor on and, and allow the power boaters to come and you pass port to port. You cannot, you cannot tack through the narrows and stop traffic. All right. It's a really important thing to remember. Um, if it's all yours, there's no one coming. If it's all yours, but uh, be wary of, of the traffic and, and use common sense. And we're very fortunate for the cat gathering um, to have been allowed to break this rule uh, with the help of the harbor master and the town. So, um, but you know, could be some could be interesting in the cat gathering and I think about it uh, with that bar. Uh, so then then the number two is the ocean inlet. The northern one, Ted is concerned about it. He's uh, there's definitely less water and it is even more severe in S turn to find the channel. It looks like it might be filling a little bit. So um, he's keeping an eye on that. Uh, so, but right now it's still, you can do it, but be very, very careful. Um, did have one customer who in a big power boat try it uh, the other day and uh, he, he turned back. He couldn't figure, the buoys weren't there and he couldn't figure it out. Uh, it's not like it was, but there's still water there. He's saying it's, it, it's, it's, it's navigable, but uh, he's worried about the deeper uh, fishing boats and, um, uh, and, and just getting the buoys right. But just beware, okay? Going Are around Minnesota. Set yet? Sorry? Have they set those buoys yet? Not last week. No, the the general there. ones are there. But not there were some there yesterday. Yeah. We drove off road and yeah. we're all through the. Okay. Yeah. The orange. The orange. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Really close. Then that means they're probably a stage harbor now, too. Well, he's gotten out there. Um, so that's it. Any questions about uh, sailing Pleasant Bay? Uh, as far as going down the river, everything appears to be the same. Uh, no issues. Still got that little speed bump. 
where uh, you're leaving the Amakoi River into the Little Bay, heading for the sailing school, dead low tide, you're gonna, with people with 18 inches and over, you've got a little bit of a ooh, soft mud. That's a dead low, right? That's a dead low, yeah. yeah. But it appears that everything else is still still the same. I don't know if uh, does anybody know anything about the dredging uh, talk that nothing, yeah. So there was some talk of it, but I don't know if that's gonna postponed. Postponed. Dredging what the name of it? Uh, areas and oh, postponed. Postponed. <clears throat> well that's good. You've been away. Just our, just our. They're waiting for, for us, us, who know the river. We won't have a lot of people coming down. With, so. the global, <laughs> with global warming, the level will go up, so maybe they won't have to dredge. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jeff, uh, Julia mentioned the uh, bulkhead, and uh, uh, you know, it's we're gonna. It's not done yet. We've still got to run our water and power line, and then we're gonna deck the top of it. It's gonna be this really nice uh, depot deck on top. Uh, that you, you can hand moorings over and whatnot, and you folks can hang out waiting for someone on a on a on a bench. It's gonna it's gonna be really really nice. The old concrete bulkhead coming out was that? It's the it, it it's still there. Is that gonna remain? And that still remains. Yeah. So we put big. another bulkhead in front of it. Right. Okay. And then we anchored. So this when Jim Kidd uh, built this in, uh, when he and um, uh, Will Joy. Uh, Built it in 1953. Uh, Will had the concrete company here, take concrete, and um, he uh, they just backloaded a ton of concrete, but they didn't put any anchors in. <laughs> uh, well, there was no reason to back then because there was no real tide to worry about for undermining. You know, they weren't thinking of you know nor'easters coming up in three feet of so. Then all that happened in the, in the 90s on up and uh, with the breaks. And so that our bulkhead with every tide was getting undermined because there was nothing holding it back. And so we were losing it and we were losing it and it sink. So Anchor Marine came in and uh, we built a, a bulkhead outside of it. And it's, oh my God, it'll be here a thousand years. <laughs> There's like nine anchors with through I with galvanized bolts running through, sure. holding it back, and uh, it's going nowhere. And we in a couple of years we're going to do the far one, the the most southern one. That one's starting to deteriorate a little bit, but for, it's been on my mind for years, and, uh, and it's so good to have it have it now secured. All right. Um, Yep, and we'll wind it up with just our regular uh, uh, list of events. The um, Haley and I, uh, we've been, as you've heard throughout this, we've been busy. Apologize, we didn't get our spring newsletter out. So I'm going to, if, if you have, we, um, or you could give Haley a call, but I'll, I'll list, you know, the events and then we'll have some uh, NSA uh, bill and boy, but talk about NSA sailing, but. Um, we are going to get our newsletter out. There might be a spring summer newsletter, but and that'll have more, you know, the more detail you can mark things on your calendar. But uh, just a reminder, we're going to always do our uh, continue, which is growing, which I'm really excited about. Our Wednesday night sales, uh, basically 5:30 at the dock. There's no formal. Um, uh, I tried email, but I, I'm just not good at it. And um, it's just if you if it, if the sun is out. And, or or not even sun. If it's not pouring rain and light and thunderstorms, we're going out. We're thirty mile an hour wind. Well, thirty mile. We can. <laughs> no, yeah. If it's really really windy and stormy, we're not going out. But just as we are going out, and I'm going out alone. So I just uh, it's allows me just to. It's on my weekly schedule, and I love it. And uh, whatever, and we do whatever the tide tells us we can do based on the time but it's basically 5 30 we gather and we head out we meet others like don crone and others out there at the mouth of the river and um and we do a sail around for an hour and a half or so and it's a great way to meet other customers cat boat sailors trade notes trade secrets and um and uh and get a midweek midweek sailing so that's every wednesday night that's going to start 
uh, right after the Wooden Boat Show. So it's uh, late June. Uh, we'll be at the Wooden Boat Show this year with uh, Andiamo, which is our most recent caracal. Very special boat, teak decks, varnish to the nines. Beautiful boat worth, uh, you know, you, you won't see her here because she uh, more is in Wellfleet, um, but it'd be a great chance to see her uh, at the Wooden Boat Show. And then uh, uh, we will, then we have NSA uh, every Sunday. And then we have, and I've been doing Chatham Yacht Club every Saturday and having a great time with it. Happy to talk to anybody interested in, in adding that to your schedule. Um, but uh, they run a wonderful uh, program as well. I'm pretty sure you have to be a member though. To, yeah, the, the only time it's open for anybody is their regatta weekend. Um, is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So regatta weekend be a way to try it. And that's uh, August 5th um, this year. Largest free regatta in the United States. Well, there you go. Yeah. And uh, it's a, a lot of fun. Um, we are uh, planning to take, uh, I will be doing all that. Plus we will be taking the XFC if all's going well on a series ending uh, with Aries Pond Cat Gathering, but we will be at the Agamogan Reach Race in Brooklyn, Maine on August 5th, um, if all's all is well. Um, and yeah, so uh, Bill? Uh, Laura. Laura. Yes. So Laura's from the Namaquoit Sailing Association and um, I'm, I'm Laura, I'm from Namaquoit Sailing Association and we would like to invite everybody to join us for our adult and family racing program this summer. Uh, we race on Sundays from late June to the middle of August. We're doing six weekends and 15 races. And four of our weekends will be mini regattas with prizes. So I'm going to win a prize. Um, we're open to boats from 12 to 20 feet. And we divide our fleet into three classes, the 14-foot cat boats, 15-foot and over cat boats, plus sloops. And then we have a new performance class um, for the summer. Uh, all the info that you need is on our website, namacoitsailing.org. Um, and there's a racing link. So everything that you would need is there. Um, it is free to NSA members. Um, and if you would like to race with us, uh, for the summer, you can join as an associate member, and that uh, uh, that's on the website. You can register and pay and do all of that on, online. And if you're not sure if you want to uh, join for the whole summer, we have a one-time free trial. So just come for a weekend and uh, give us a try and see if you want to join. Um, and that can also be uh, so that you can sign up for that on the website. Um, and uh, you do have to register, though. So even if you're coming for the free race, we're not going to be able to score you unless we know you're coming. So please... Uh, use the website and sign up. I have a few handouts. I'll leave them up here. This is our schedule. And also the um, the website is here. So if you are interested, um, please take a handout. And also we'll be hanging out after if anybody has any questions. All right. Have fun. Meet nice people. It's a good night. <laughs> Thank you, Maura. Um, next, we have Mark Faraday. Yeah, scientist, Mass Audubon, I believe he's in the back. Yeah. As Mark comes up also afterwards, guys, if you have any specific questions or more detailed stuff, I'm gonna, a few of us will be here, but you're welcome, we'll chat, um, ask questions. Again, if you want more um, detailed conversation, we'll be hanging around. So, but there we go. This is Mark. Hello. So, let me do this. There's a lot of people. Uh, I didn't really, I should have asked about, you know, a projector and that screen and that kind of stuff. Uh, but normally I would have a PowerPoint presentation. Can, I, can everyone see this? <laughs> we'll pass it around <laughs> you know uh, i'll look at it but um i don't really need to so yeah I'll hold up my phone um so my name is mark faraday i'm the science coordinator for nowadays mass autumn on cape cod we've sort of regionalized 
uh, internally anyway. Um, and so I oversee various research projects, mostly based out of the Wellfleet Bay Sanctuary Research and Endangered Species Monitoring, uh, everything from everybody's favorite beach nesting shorebird, piping plovers, and boo, settle down. <laughs> Uh, and then the, you know, a lot of Bob Prescott's turtle work continues. I have some nominal invo involvement in overseeing that work. Bob's, Bob's still around uh, overseeing that to some extent. Um, and then horseshoe crabs is, is one of our biggest, longest running projects. And that also dates back to Bob Prescott's interest, the former our sanctuary director emeritus uh, and or Orleans resident. A lot of you know Bob. But he was very interested in horseshoe crabs and concerned about their populations going back to the 90s and before, and has had Wellfleet Bay involved in horseshoe crab research and ongoing annual spawning surveys going back to the late, the late 90s. And so we have some of the longest data sets, we have the longest data sets in the state when it comes to spawning surveys of um, horseshoe crabs coming into the beaches in May and June. To, to lay their eggs. And we've done academic research. We've partnered with the Division of Marine Fisheries on a couple of different graduate projects, one looking at genetics, one looking at sonic telemetry, down in uh, two looking at sonic telemetry, one in Chatham and one in Wellfleet Harbor where they put little sonic transmitters on horseshoe crabs, and then a whole bunch of receiver buoys around the harbor working with a UMass professor, um, kind of looking, the same ones that pick up the great white sharks, those same kind of receiver buoys, but we picked up quite a few great white sharks. This was like 10 years ago. I was like, oh, we picked up 12 great white sharks in Wellfleet Harbor. <laughs> really like, yeah. um, but so, you know, we've done academic research with them, answering different, trying to answer different questions we have about the ecology of horseshoe crabs. And all of this is targeted at trying to figure out how to manage them better and working with the Division of Marine Fisheries to get them to manage horseshoe crabs better. And you know, why is an environmental organization so excited about a 450 million year old sea tick? Uh, that's a terrible thing to call them. But you know, they're more closely related to ticks and spiders. They're not crabs. Call them crabs, but they're not crabs. And they're more, more closely related to ticks and spiders, uh, though they're harmless. But everybody loves them, I think, for the most part. You know, whether you sell them for money or you just see them at the beach and you miss them from your childhood, everybody seems to love horseshoe crabs. Whenever we do things for them, um, we get a lot of get a lot of people in the door. Whenever we do talks and conferences and things, but um, but everything from the the academic studies to the the annual spawning survey work that we do with volunteers, it's all been targeted towards answering questions that that help that we work with the state to better manage horseshoe crabs. Um, but but conservation organizations are really interested in horseshoe crabs because of this connection with shorebirds, in particular bird conservation organization like Mass Audubon. You, raise your hand if you know about the whole Delaware Bay thing and the horseshoe crabs and the shorebirds down there. Not many. Well, let me tell you, uh, <laughs> it's a whole thing. There's books and books and documentaries about it. So um, horseshoe crabs are more common down, you know, south of here. Um, the, probably their peak abundance is around Delaware Bay and the states that share Delaware Bay, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, tons of them in South Carolina. Um, and there's a, a shorebird that is actually most easily seen here in Massachusetts in Chatham from July through October called the Red Knot. It's a high Arctic nesting, beautiful shorebird, about yay big, with this salmon-y colored you know, um, breast and, and breeding plumage. We tend to see them in southbound migration. But in the spring, they nest in the, above the Arctic Circle. And in the fall, they make their way down to the south end of South America, however many thousands of miles that is. And boy, are their wings tired. And then um, most of their life cycle, they're eating like small, you know, like the equivalent of uh, mussel spat, little shellfish, Gemma clams, you know, the Gemma clams that never get any bigger than that, but small shellfish is what they kind of specialize in. And they do that in South America. And then they fly when it's time to come north for the breeding season again, they fly north from Tierra del Fuego, you know, almost Antarctica, back to South Carolina or most famously beaches of Delaware Bay. 
including like suburban beaches in New Jersey. You just get out of your car and you walk and it's just a beach and there's thousands of horseshoe crabs spawning at densities such that they're digging up each other's eggs, which means they're available at the surface for shorebirds that have little bills like this that could not get at horseshoe crab eggs, which are six, eight inches down. But because there are so many of them, they've evolved these, these shorebirds and not just red knots, but others have evolved to come take advantage of this. And there's laughing gulls and other, other things taking advantage of this too. And so we know that this subspecies of red knot, the rufous subspecies that goes all the way down to South America really depends on that resource of those horseshoe crab eggs to A, replenish their reserves from that long flight. They show up all shriveled up and they have to replace that and then gain even more weight to get them up to the Arctic Circle in body condition to breed. And so the management of horseshoe crabs south of us by the Atlantic States Marines Fishery Commission, the same coastwide commission that sets quotas for cod, every, everything else that you can think of lobster, that, that's an important fishery. They also do that for horseshoe crabs. And the way they manage them down there is entirely for this ecological function of the horseshoe crabs where there are these shorebirds that depend on them red knots, ready turnstone, semi-palmated sandpipers, all declining Arctic nesting shorebirds that conservation organizations are concerned about. And so that drives the management down there of this fishery is making sure that there is still enough to provide eggs for these shorebirds. But up here in Massachusetts, that connection is not so visible. You know, maybe it never was as strong as it is down there, but we know that it's, that link is there. If you go to Monomoy, not many people, I mean, maybe you guys are boaters. I don't know if you ever get down to Monomoy in May and June, particularly May. <laughs> Most of the horseshoe crabs in Massachusetts spawn in May, and then by June, they're kind of depleted. But if you were to go to certain parts of South Monomoy in May, you would see enough horseshoe crabs that there are shorebirds eating the eggs. It's the only place in Massachusetts, really. And why is that? It's because they're protected from all forms of harvest, bait and biomedical and the habitat is protected, right? I mean, that's a national wildlife refuge. There's good spawning habitat for them and there's good habitat for the juveniles. They take 10 years to mature. And so they need, you know, quiet flats and marsh creeks and things like that to grow. They molt constantly. You see the molts, like the little crispy, uh, kind of lighter colored shells that some people, not you guys, not locals, <laughs> But some rubes think that they're dead crabs uh, and call them in. There's a die off of horseshoe crabs, but it's the molts of the young ones. It's actually a good sign. Um, and so they need those kind of backwaters and marshes as nursery grounds. And so Monomoy has it all. And so we see that you can have this connection in Massachusetts. It was broken long ago, probably during the bounty era. And so does anybody remember having a shellfish permit and you had to kill horseshoe crabs? No one. <laughs> Yes. It wasn't that long ago. You don't have to be 110 years old to remember that. It really, it wasn't that long ago. I saw that language still in the heart on the Harwich website. I live in Harwich. That somebody just like forgot, left an old document up there or whatever. And you were supposed to, if you had a shellfish permit, you were supposed to kill horseshoe crabs by breaking off the telson and throw them up above the high tide line because they were shellfish pests, right? They eat the, the young shellfish. Um, there's never really been any evidence that that's something that is ecologically significant or actually affects clam populations. It was just like, oh, they eat clams, kill them. And that, and whelk, right? So these two things that now are commercially fished for money uh, used to be trash species that you had to kill. It's, so, it's such an interesting case study in how we think about and manage natural resources, horseshoe crabs. Like really you could do a whole graduate course. Um, there's this field, the social dimensions of natural resource management is my favorite class in grad school. And it's just looking how all the different stakeholders think about a species and horseshoe crabs, it doesn't get any more interesting than that because you have the bird advocates, you know, talking about the red knots and the way they manage them. You have the biomedical firms uh, who depend on the blood to produce LAL, which is the only FDA approved test for bacterial contamination of say vaccine components and, and injectable other injectable drugs and things here in the US. Um, and then the, the bait harvesters and the, the biomedical harvesters and then the companies and 
big G seafoods, the big the company in New Bedford that buys the bait crabs and sells them to the whelk fishermen. So I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So that's the ecological part of it. Um, why do, how do we use horseshoe crabs here in Massachusetts and, and elsewhere? Um, there, was the, the, there was the bounty era where it's just like, kill them. You could get money for a Telson. It, yeah, so you could, I don't know, it was like five cents. It was, it was a while ago. Uh, but you could bring in horseshoe crab Telsons after you'd thrown it up above the high tide line so it just dies. And they can't flip themselves over when you take the Telson off the tail. And you could get a you could get money for those. So it was a it was a funded a government funded extermination program. So horseshoe crabs went through that era, and so who knows what you know what the population was relative to what it should have been coming out of that era. But the state doesn't manage them in a way that they're trying to get back to whatever the population was before, because we kind of don't know. And so they're content to be like, all right, they were lowered to this level for the bounty era, and we'll just kind of like. As long as they're not crashing, we'll just kind of keep harvesting them the way they do. And we harvest them for a couple of different things. There's the biomedical harvest, which is very important. Um, there historically was one company in Massachusetts called Associates of Cape Cod, and they're involved in the research, developing this test using the, the ancient immune system of the horseshoe crab, um, where they it, it basically coagulates around um, endotoxins from gram-negative bacteria uh, when it enters their kind of open bloodstream. And so they turn that into an assay that coagulates around um, uh, gram-negative bacteria endotoxins and lights up in a way and there's a machine, you put it in and it, it's a test to tell if you have too much bacteria in say the, the purified water that you're using to make the COVID vaccine. It's like some big thousand gallon, I don't know, they, they test batches of, com um, of components and um, a lot of other, a lot of other things that we don't know is happening. They used to do a rabbit fever test. Rabbits are very relieved that they started <laughs> developing this horseshoe crab test because they would kind of like swab a rabbit and if it got a fever and died, you know, like up oh, it's contaminated. And I think that someone still does that. But anyway, so that's a pretty important use. It's a big industry. Um, and so Associates of Cape Cod is there in Falmouth, and they have other things. They've developed their version of a synthetic alternative. The synthetic alternative is, is this whole other thing that I'll, I'll get to and remind, remind me if I don't get back to it. But they sell this LAL to biomedical companies all around the world who need to do that test to develop their drugs and bring them to market or whatever else. And that's still the only FDA approved test. I guess now I should get to the synthetic alternatives. Years ago, oh, sorry, yeah. How many do they harvest a year? We never knew because of these arcane rules in fisheries under Magnuson-Stevens Act and other, other state level equivalents. There are multiple layers of rules that make it so they can't release data for small fisheries with only two or three players. So there's just the one biomedical company. And then, you know, Pleasant Bay, there's just a couple people harvesting for biomedical. And so they never told us those numbers. Now we have a sense of it because they just came out with a, a quota for the first time ever, the state is proposing a quota for the biomedical harvest at 200,000. And they said that's well above what it's ever been. So I would guess it's around 100,000 crabs. They were bleeding per year. I don't know. I actually for, don't know. For what area? Maybe less. Massachusetts. Just Massachusetts. And, and it comes from two places. It comes, the hand harvest from Pleasant Bay, the kind of boutique, you know, um, what's his name? Harrington. Uh, yeah. Jay Harrington, who I know he passed away, and then I'm not sure who yeah. else does it now. It's just a couple, it's just a couple people. Um, but then they get a lot from draggers in Nantucket Sound. Fluke, you know, the fluke fishery, they would get them as bycatch, and so they get a they get an authorization to keep the, some of the horseshoe crabs they catch while they're fluke fishing. I would say the majority of horseshoe crabs in Massachusetts are harvested by draggers in um, mm -hmm. Nantucket Sound right now, not very far from Monomoy. So they benefit from the Monomoy closure, right? That's effectively a, um, like a marine sanctuary where the horseshoe crabs can pump out young and then they go out into Nantucket Sound. And so that keeps that Nantucket Sound horseshoe crab fishery sustainable. But, but that, 
So enter Charles River. You know about Charles River Labs coming to Harwich right here, my town, and under everybody's noses. Their, their competitor, ACC, wasn't expecting it. The state wasn't expecting it. Um, they're sort of a black hat among well, like the horseshoe crab conservation community, this company. They're based out of Arlington, but they've never actually done anything in Massachusetts in terms of bleeding horseshoe crab. They always did that in South Carolina and Asia. They're, they're the biggest company in the world when it comes to bleeding horseshoe crabs. They have like more than 50% of the market, I think because of their Asian um, outfits. They're, they're horseshoe crabs in Asia too, they're similar species and they do the same thing. They harvest the blood and use it to make a test. So anyway, under everybody's noses, they moved to Harwich, Harwich approves it. And then all of a sudden by this time last year, they're operational at a bay by the, you know, by the dump in Harwich that I drive by all the time. So the state is now saying, wait a minute, you know, the regulators, the biologists, like, okay, we've got to figure this out. They're contracting with some harvesters. All of a sudden the, the biomedical harvest went up exponentially in one year. And so that's why the state is now capping it but like way higher than it's ever been. So that's concerning to people because the biomedical fishery has always been considered like catch and release. But we've always known that it's, you know, at least around a 15% mortality. Some studies show it as high as 30% mortality for any crab that's get bled, that gets bled and they target the females often during spawning season. Just think about that. Like, and this is something I'm going to come back to repeatedly, because the more I think about how we manage horseshoe crabs in Massachusetts, the less it makes sense. And so they'll take them during May and June, because that's when you can find them coming into shallower waters. They'll put them in holding pens for it's they're not supposed to do it for more than, I don't know, 24 hours or something like that. But they'll have them in these cages. They're in they're out here in Pleasant Bay. They're in Nantucket. They're um, they're in Stage Harbor. The guy who's supplying Charles River has his in Stage Harbor. And so, you know, it's affecting spawning because they're, they're targeting females because they're bigger, they have more blood, and they're taking them at the time of year when they're trying to spawn. But, and then up to 30% of them are not surviving being bled. And so when we do surveys in Pleasant Bay, we see a lot more crabs than we see in Cape Cod Bay, but, but the sex ratio is crazy. It's like nine males for every female. So that's like something's up there. It's got to be the, the targeting of the females for the for the biomedical harvest. Um, so so here's Charles River Labs, they're operating. And so that was an opportunity for the state, or just sort of push the state to kind of get their house in order when it comes to horseshoe crab management. It is not a priority fishery in terms of the dollar value of the horseshoe crab fishery per year. I, there's a list on the website and it's like number 20 something, you know, the top, like up at the top, you have sea scallops, lobsters, um, Jonah crabs these days, and these what kind of ones you'd expect. And then horseshoe crabs are sort of way down the list. And there, there's, and then there's the bait harvest, right? So that's the biomedical harvest. Um, before I leave the biomedical, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll get back to the synthetic alternative, right? I don't have my slides as my crutch. <laughs> Maybe you saw the New York Times. Did anybody see the New York Times op-ed recently by Deborah Kramer? She's an author who wrote a book about the connection between horseshoe crabs and red knots. And um, she's kind of a force of nature. She's, she's an activist, very good at doing research and, and getting her point across. And she's done multiple New York Times pieces. She lives on the North Shore. And she did a New York Times op-ed recently about, mostly about the synthetic alternative and we need to get it approved and the US pharmacopeia needs to approve it. Um, nothing that's particularly relevant for what we're doing in Massachusetts, but it was a New York Times op-ed. So it's been shared widely, you know, it made it to the desk of the president of Mass Audubon. And he's like, what are we doing about this? Um, and so I thought maybe you guys had seen that. And so a lot of people are aware of the fact that there is a synthetic alternative to the horseshoe crab blood-based test out there called RFC and it's a um, sort of a laboratory generated way of creating one of the enzymes from the horseshoe crabs three enzyme cascade immune response thing it's whatever the biochemistry is over my head and I took biochemistry um, 
but it's out there. It's apparently been approved in Europe in the last few years. It's not widely used. Uh, my understanding is it, it's not as sensitive. I don't want to get into the biochemistry of it, but there's this weird situation where the conservation organizations in New Jersey have joined forces with Eli Lilly, the pharma giant, mm -hmm. because there's a birder <clears throat> high up at Eli Lilly who's got religion. And he is working with the, the conservation organizations to get the synthetic alternative approved, um, thinking that that's gonna really help, help horseshoe crabs. And, and it, it will, I guess, but there's a lot, there's a lot that would need to happen. And if they approved RFC tomorrow, I don't think it would do much at all for horseshoe crabs. The overwhelming mortality of horseshoe crabs from bait harvest, Atlantic coast wide. And there's like this amount, like there's a, the graph I saw recently where it's like a line and like this much of it is the mortality from bait. And at the top, there's like this much of it is from the biomedical harvest. So I don't know why they're so obsessed with the biomedical, with, with that part of it. Part of it is that in New Jersey, there is no bait harvest. The bait harvest, which I'll get to, is, is not allowed in New Jersey or South Carolina. You can't harvest females at all in the Delaware Bay states. Every other state has more restrictive um, protection measures for horseshoe crabs than Massachusetts. And they have bigger populations than they always did. Um, but they take care of their horseshoe crabs more to protect this ecological connection to shorebirds. In Massachusetts, we don't even acknowledge it, nor do we acknowledge the bounty era declines. It's really back asswards what we're doing, what DMF is doing with horseshoe crabs here. Um, so that's the synthetic alternative. Um, ACC has their own, ver there are other versions out there. And my understanding is even if they approved it tomorrow, it's not gonna be widely adopted because you need, a, you have to buy new machines, right? You, so you're, think you're a company, you've always been using LAL to get your drugs to market. And you have the machines that read the LAL test and you know it's, it's all in your budget and you know how to do it and everybody's trained on it. Why are you going to switch to a more expensive alternative that requires totally new machines and et cetera, et cetera? So I don't think this whole get RFC approved and horseshoe crabs will be saved. It doesn't make any sense to me. Here in Massachusetts, we are focused on phasing out the bait harvest, you know, getting things more sustainable, having the management be focused on population recovery instead of like limping them along in whatever they're defining as sustainable. So getting to the bait harvest, the, the bait harvest uh, traditionally was a hand harvest, somebody in a whaler or whatever skiff and a lot like, like a clam rake and they get out and they come while they're spawning, just come in and they're targeting the females. All the harvest targets females at the time of year that they're spawning. Like what fishery does that? It's like, it's like if you're trying to make them go extinct, that's what you do in, in any kind of wildlife management. Well, we'll target the females with eggs. Yeah, that's good for the population. It's just, you don't do that in wild, any kind of animal population management unless you hate the species. <laughs> but that's what we do. That's what we do in Mass. And, and not just Massachusetts, but the traditional bait harvest. And it's convenience. It's that's what they come into shore. If they didn't spawn right at the high tide line. Nobody would be talking about horseshoe crabs. Um, you know, if they spawned offshore, out of sight, out of mind, it just, they wouldn't be a thing the way they are now. But so they, they harvest them while they're spawning, they target the females and whatever males are attached to them just are along for the ride and they go in and they go to a freezer in New Bedford where they might sit for three years because I think they're kind of overstocked for the bait right now. And so instead of spawning for those three years that, you know, she's sitting in a freezer and then, you know, they cut up, cut them up. And some of them will get bled through a, a dual use program called the Rent-A-Crab program. <laughs> and so ACC will, will either someone will bring the crabs directly to them because they have a bait dealer license and then they bleed them and then sell them to, in, back into the bait market somehow, but they get used for both. And it feels very efficient, doesn't it, right? Wow, well, they're gonna be chopped up for bait. Let's get some blood out of them first. Um, a lot of people don't like that. Um, but I still can't get past how it feels efficient. Like if you're gonna be doing that, let's get two uses out of them. So they go to the bait dealer, the bait, it's basically one company in New Bedford called I think Big G Seafoods. They buy the horseshoe crabs from the bait harvesters. They sell them to the whelk fishery, fishers. Anybody know there's a whelk fishery? 
It's a $3 million fishery, mostly Nantucket Sound, Martha's Vineyard. It's a pot fishery, like lobsters and whelk or big snails. They're like conch. If you go to the Bahamas, you have conch, same thing. Incidentally, the queen conch has just been proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act by the federal government. Snail fisheries are generally not sustainable. And the whelk fishery, where you know pots, whelk, chopped up horseshoe crabs for bait out there in Nantucket Sound, whatever, it didn't used to be a thing. And then somehow the market developed and it became lucrative. And so all these people got into that fishery. They're buying horseshoe crabs for bait. It's a $3 million fishery. Um, it is classified by Mass Division Marine Fisheries as overfished, has been for years. They maintain it because of political pressure, because, you know, because people make money off of it. And if they propose changes, somebody goes to the governor's office, and then somebody goes from the governor's office down to the Division Marine Fisheries into Bedford and says, what are you doing? And so, it, so they recently, even though they know it's unsustainable, overfished, and they had these very weak potential regulations phased in for, for the whelk fishery. We're like, we'll give ourselves 10 years to get up to like the right size limit so that we're not harvesting them all before they have a chance to breed. Like they know the biologists at DMF, they're like, we're, they can harvest them all before they've ever had a chance to lay eggs. It's just like, again, it's not how you manage a fishery. But they had, they're like, oh, over the next 10 years, we'll, we'll gradually like increase the size. So we'll be protecting, like allowing them to breed before we're harvesting them. And it's all, it's mostly an Asian market, right? You might think, what are they doing with them? Like every once in a while, you might see scongeli at an Italian restaurant, which is well, but it's Asia and maybe Europe to some extent. It's an export market. So Big G Seafoods, who buys the horseshoe crab, sells them to the whelk fishermen, and then buys the whelk from the whelk fishermen and sells them. They went to the state and they're like, eh, can we do something about these restrictions on the whelk fishery that are being phased in over 10 years? And DMF was like, yes, right away. And they did it right away. So these already inadequate phased in over 10 years, allowing them to harvest them all. It just, they, they walked it back as soon as industry asked them to. And I asked the woman in charge at a meeting, a public meeting, I was like, this cannot be your favorite fishery to have to explain publicly. You know, like, why did you do that? And they're like, well, no one came out to the meeting to oppose it. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's not the public's job to do the manage the fishery. It's your job. And who, yeah, because no one knows about the whelk fishery. That's why nobody came out. So the whelk fishery is, in, you know, intricately entwined with the horseshoe crab fishery. It's why there's a bait fishery. It's the whelk fishery shouldn't really exist based on sustainability parameters. And if you think about it, and I never really had, they're snails. You fish them below a certain density, they can't find love, right? It's a snail. Like, what are they going to do? Jet 10 miles that way to find a female? So, yeah, they, 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 none of them are sustainable. And that's the biologist at DMF who I'm always like kind of sparring with. He's like, yeah, there are no sustainable snail fisheries that I know of. And that's why the queen conch is now going on this endangered species list. You'll have to go to the Bahamas to get your conch critters. Um, so we're harvesting horseshoe crabs, targeting females with eggs while they're spawning to, to be used as bait in an unsustainable fishery. And not only that, we think of a bait species or, or any kind of bait, right? You want to be efficient using something for bait. Uh, my, my older brother had lobster traps when I was a kid and we used to go out in Plymouth, um, off, off of Plymouth, like off the nuclear plant there. We had 10 lobster traps <laughs> and we got these, the best lobsters, they were glowing, they were huge. <laughs> four claws, boy, those, those Pilgrim nuclear plant lobsters with the four claws, you can't beat them. But we, there used to be more, of a, more fishing out of Plymouth Harbor and we'd go there and we'd get the filleted, you know, flounder carcasses, really good lobster bait. That feels like an efficient use of a resource, right? If you're gonna use something for bait, it shouldn't be an ecologically important species that's gone through a massive historical decline because of the bounty era that is you know, connected with, with shorebirds, it takes 10 years to mature. Like what bait species takes 10 years to become sexually mature? You put conservation measures in place, you have to wait 15 years to see if they work. It is not appropriate to be used as a bait species 
And we shouldn't keep doing it just because, well, that's what we do. You know, it's just inertia and laziness and money. Um, and so, so, you know, that's where we're at. And so what happened this year, because of Charles River coming in, um, the state is scrambling to rethink how they manage horseshoe crabs. They're doing good things. They're paying more attention to the biomedical harvest. They're, they're getting out on the trawlers to look at how that works and how many of them die in the court. Like a lot of them just will probably die in the course of getting dragged up. I think it happens in Wellfleet Harbor too. Um, and they're refining the best management practices that they want the uh, biomedical harvest to be using, harvesters to be using. They're proposing to reduce the annual quota by what they assume the biomedical mortality is. The annual state quota is like 165,000 and they're proposing dropping it by 25,000 crabs and that's good. Um, they're proposing, most importantly, some of us in a local organization and Mass Audubon, this local organization called Horseshoe Crab, the Horseshoe Crab Conservation Association. It's been around for decades, very quietly, kind of like meeting and, and working directly with DMF, make, make, forcing them to hold meetings to explain the management and lobbying for better management, that kind of thing. We met with them. We met with Dan McKiernan, the director of Division Marine Fisheries and his staff, and we recommended some conservation measures. And at the end, he's like, mm, we can look at that one. And that one was we were recommending no harvest of horseshoe crabs until June 15th to protect three quarters of the spawning season. Um, that's a lot less than what they do in New Jersey, say, or, or South Carolina, or some of the other states where you can't even, you can't harvest females at all. But it was like, it was something, we're just trying to work with them. And so we formally petitioned them. Uh, and a couple of us from Mass Audubon are on the board of the Horseshoe Crab Conservation Association, including Bob Prescott. And we petitioned them, you know, closed out harvest until June 15th. They came back and proposed a whole bunch of new rules around horseshoe crabs that are now under public debate. This is the public comment period through May 1st. And there's a hearing Monday night in Plymouth, which I feel like they planned the bridge work. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it in Plymouth, not on the Cape where everybody harvests horseshoe crabs. There are no hearings on the Cape. And they mixed it in with like fluke regs and it's all like, they did a lot of things because I think they were afraid that there would be a public outcry. And one reason is the Atlantic States Marines Fishery Commission, I didn't even, just let me get back and try to finish a point, finish a sentence. They proposed, we said June 15th, they came back with March, uh, I'm sorry, May 31st. So replacing the current harvest restrictions, which is, five day no harvest windows around the moons in mid April through June. They're gonna replace those with a blanket, no harvest January 1st through May 31st for bait or biomedical. Okay, it's better than it is now. It's an important first step. We're asking people to write letters in support of that. We'll just write a quick email to DMF. Just be like, we support the conservation measures. And a lot of people don't want any bait. A lot of people we talk to don't want any harvest at all. We're like, well, you know, the biomedical harvest is pretty important. Uh, and so people were asking people to say, if you don't want any harvest at all, at least just say no, you know, phase out the bait harvest when they're writing their letters to DMF. Um, so that, yeah. So that, again, the public comment period, and it's just a quick email to marine.fish at mass.gov or something like that I, I can oh yeah you guys already sent it out an email you might have seen this yeah, already we did. and i'll send an email to everybody who rsvp yeah with another one yeah um yeah because a lot of a lot of people are are activated by this and it's oh what i was going to say is on a, a slightly bigger stage the atlantic states marines fishery commission uh managing regulations for delaware bay they recently were proposing, based on some population modeling, to once again allow females to be harvested. And again, you can't harvest female horseshoe crabs at all. You can do all of this in Massachusetts. You can harvest them while they're spawning. You can harvest females, you know, all these things. You can harvest them for bait, things that you can't do in, in some of these other states. So they were proposing going back to allowing female harvest again. 
And so all the conservation groups kind of, you know, New Jersey Audubon, everybody else um, was like, what? You know, can we see the model you're basing that on? Because these are a lot of the biologists down there don't support this. They're like, you know, we have our own models. Can you show us your models? And they filed a freedom of information request and they didn't release the models. And so they, they're like, they're not ready yet. But like, wait a minute, I, they're ready enough that you're using them to, you know, change the regs, but you won't release them. It was just a bizarre story down there. Long story short, they got 34,000 public comments in favor of not allowing female harvest anymore. And they reversed. I mean, they were just a sh big ship ready to continue with what they were doing. And they just about faced because of public comment. And if they don't... <laughs> And if, and if they don't get public comment, like what happened with well, like, well, nobody said anything, so we're going to make it even less sustainable, um, then, you know, they don't necessarily do the right thing. And they're not bad people. They have a lot of people breathing down their necks, you know, legislative aides and people from the governor's office. I, you know, I don't know what Maura Healy's mind is there. She's new and they're trying to get their head around all kinds of things. But when a big company from Falmouth goes, sends people up there and says, this is too restrictive for our business, we're going to go out of business, and somebody goes down, to, you know, like I said, and, and pressures, you know, I wouldn't want to be a fishery regulator, because you know how to, you know, nobody's happy with what you're doing. If everybody's a little bit unhappy, you're doing your job, you know, this, their proposed new rules weren't enough for the conservationists, they're too restrictive for the harvesters, so like, they're, they're never pleasing anybody. Uh, you know, and they're trying, they're just, they're not trying hard enough. Um, so anyway, uh, we love it if, you know, people could think about this and uh, look at the email that went around. It's just, just you, it's nothing fancy. You really, uh, honestly, just send an email to your director, McKernan, or whatever, don't even, whoever, to whom it may concern. <laughs> we support conservation, and it's just a tick on our side. It's just, we need numbers we support conservation. We support the conservation because it's modest and long overdue, but they have cold feet. And I could hear it in his voice when he was proposing these new, very modest uh, new rules protecting spawning horseshoe crabs to the Marine Fisheries Advisory Commission, which is a panel of entirely industry people who give thumbs up or thumbs down on new fisheries regulations. So that's the way it works. The director of the Division of Marine Fisheries proposes new regulations. There's a public hearing uh, or two and a public comment period. And then it goes before the Marine Fisheries Advisories Commission and they, you know, they give thumbs up or thumbs down. But they're all, you know, they're all fishers um, or, you know, in recreational, commercial, but they're all, you know, there's no conservation representation on the Marine Fisheries Advisories Commission. Um, and I feel like they already have cold feet about these modest regulations. Like he sounded apologetic as he was presenting these. Like uh, May thirty first, you know, maybe don't maybe don't prove it. Whatever, uh, May thirty first, harvest closure. So we need people. We need people. To, the silent majority to to voice their opinions. Any Matt, questions? Is it helpful yeah. if we have customers who aren't Massachusetts residents for them to send an email as well i think so because they are local users of the resources i think yeah I, yes because the people they, they know people come to the cape from all over right mm -hmm. and this is part of what we say like horseshoe crabs are part of the cape cod experience especially if you've been not so much anymore but if you've been coming for a long time you remember there being more we did a survey of a bunch of people you know just kind of a qualitative survey uh, you know, uh, do you think horseshoe crabs have declined at this beach you've been going to your whole life? And everybody was like, yes. We all remember seeing more when we were kids. Um, and a lot of people come here from every part of the state. I keep telling my advocacy people at Mass Audubon headquarters, like this is not a coastal issue. People from the Berkshires come to Cape Cod, you know, and just New York and New Jersey too. But if you're part of the local economy on the water, I think that's an and boating people mm -hmm. like th that's an important voice, you know, constituency. I think that DMF understands some random person from New Jersey who just likes horseshoe crabs, but doesn't actually come up here. I, we could get them to write letters too. like I definitely, have the, um, but they're not going to be as powerful. 
And it, yeah. So I had never really thought about that. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm kind of long-windedly thinking this through out loud. Sure. But I think <laughs> if you spend time in Massachusetts on the coast and have an opinion about horseshoe crabs, then it, that should be valuable to them. So, so good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The town, just a quick thing, the town of Wellfleet, which is a farm shellfish community, as you know, it's not, you know, there's wild, there's certainly wild shellfish harvesting there, but overwhelmingly, of course, the identity of Wellfleet is farmed oysters and clams. They requested a moratorium on horseshoe crab harvest in Wellfleet. And, and you would think that's a big constituency for the Division of Marine Fisheries. The Wellfleet shellfishing community said, we don't want any more horseshoe crab harvest. I think part of it is they don't like people being around over their grants in a boat at night with a clam rake. I think that's an old kind of uh, uh, grudge. But they were saying that, oh, there's too many worms under our grants and we don't see enough horseshoe crabs anymore and the horseshoe crabs would worm the grants. And so, but DMF rejected that twice from one of their, like a very economically important constituent of theirs. So I'm nervous. I'm very nervous that these very modest changes are not gonna get passed. DMF, you think of Massachusetts as progressive, but not, not our fisheries management. We're like, even compared to like South Carolina, you know, places you would think yeah. we'd be more progressive than. Yeah. And so, yeah, we need people to write letters. All right, thanks. Are there any other questions? Thank you. So we'll uh, we'll wrap this up. Thank you very very much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thanks, thanks for the audience. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Julia will wrap this up. I know people we've run over, so you guys have got to move on and get your boats uh, ready. Uh, <laughs> I just I forgot the cat gathering is late this year. It's August twenty sixth. Okay, so that's good for some, maybe not for others. Kids going back to school, but um, we're really excited to have it and. Um, uh, Julie, you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Um, cleaning products. Cleaning products. And the Cape Cod Maritime Museum. Um, I have this flyer here on your way out. These are environmentally friendly cleaning products made locally in Har Harlem, I believe. Um, and we really support her work here at the pond using all her, um, all her, uh, 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 clean rugs. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be terrible doing uh, infomercials. But anyway, it's all here. Uh, it's all here, and uh, you know, we got to protect our pond. We got to protect our pond, so please, no bleaches, no powerful soaps when you're cleaning your boat. All right. Um, it's, it's just, it's going right down to the bottom. And that's why we're not getting anything happening down there. So, uh, Julian, I'll wrap it up. I also, I'm a big supporter of Cape Cod Maritime Museum. So there's a what's going on there on this little flyer here. Yep. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Um, again, a few of us will hang out here if you do have questions. Anyone um, watching through Zoom uh, can reach out, of course. Um, and yeah, welcome to 2023 season. And again, can, you know, here we go. Here we go. Yeah. Oh, it's a little bit